good morning and welcome to the daily chapter reading of It's Your Loss, a book about grief. Vegetate to accumulate. Okay, this sounds counterintuitive, but self-care can be about sitting still for a second, assessing what you're doing, its impact on you, and getting comfortable with your current limitations. It's about cutting yourself some slack and saying, it's okay that I can't be a superhero today. I realized the amazing potential of doing something so familiar, it's basically second nature pretty young. There is an unparalleled comfort in knowing exactly what the next mind is. Left to its own devices, your bastard mind can easily go into free fall, so I found it really useful to give mine incredibly simple tasks and little distractions. Here is an example. When I was nine, my mom left, but in an avant-garde twist, she kicked me, my dad, and my seven-year-old brother out of the family home. So far, so traumatic. Because, of, as you probably gathered, my man was big bacon sandwich wielding, just enough love giving poured in a storm. She took in her son-in-law and her shell-shocked grandchildren. We all lived smooched together, pretending not to fall apart. When you're nine, you don't know you're falling apart, but I can now see that the frequent crying until I hyperventilated was actually a panic attack, and the years of pretty terrible insomnia weren't entirely normal. When I woke up nightly at about 1 a.m., I would occupy myself by catastrophizing everything, imagining ghosts and monsters and unknown foes, so lay praying out until it became light. It was suboptimal. But two things would soothe my racing brain. One was waking up someone in the house so the monsters wouldn't get me, and the other was old, dull <coughs> audiobooks. My first foray into self-care, though I didn't know it at the time, because I was nine. I listened to the BFG, Matilda, and the fantastic Mr. Fox over and over and over. Just having words in the background to not really focus on was a lullaby. I was dis distracted just enough to nod off. My mind had a task and by Jove, it was going to sleep on the job. The repetitive nature of things and the easy familiarity can be just the tonic. I've spoken to other friends who've lost something and they've said something familiar. That they're only able to do things that take the minimal effort and that is okay. There are times to challenge yourself and there are times to not. Trust you know yourself enough to see when to deploy neither. When Nan went, I basically only watched very old sitcoms that I knew all the words to. And weirdly, as my uncle had lent me his portable DVD player, the Catherine Pavel Not Masterpiece 27 Dresses, I to this day do not know the plot to that film. I suspect there isn't one. So pick up a book that doesn't challenge you, switch to a box set that doesn't ask you to concentrate, pod on an app specially designed to distress, like Calm or Headspace, and give your tired old brain a rest. It's earned it. Let's go outside, sing it, damn you. I stagnate a lot, a lot, a lot. But being outside was really helpful for me. Luckily, I was living on a farm that is almost a mile away from neither neighbor and so was able to do it whenever I fancied. But I didn't at first because I was busy just doing the basics in order not to waste away to no thing. If you're an extrovert, my, any activity that doesn't involve an audience or an outcome can feel, feel kind of pointless, so being outdoorsy might not feel like your natural habitat. That's why you have to do it in a way that suits you, which is likely not to be a freeform solo app. For me, I like to engage with the outdoors in three ways. <clears throat> One, a long, long, blistery beach walk with a friend where we do some soul searching. Two, running. Three, fishing. Yeah, fishing. Didn't expect that one, right? So. If you're in a muddle and heading out seems totally pointless, give it a point, it can be helpful. The first approach is self-explanatory. The second is up the gold as it cheats your brain into feeling better. It's the lazy man's route to a little moment of euphoria. 
even if you're sad, your body tricks you into not moping through a big run or any form of exercise. You might do a big cry, but you'll be doing it at speed and it will probably feel amazing to get it out. So, if you can offer yourself that remedy, then do. Exercise also gives you time to distract yourself and a place to go where other people's aren't. Podcasts on a run, walk, trampolining yoga sessions give your mind something to focus on and you can pitch it at whichever tempo you need. Ambient noise or enthralling thriller, the choice is yours. And now we come to fishing. I love fishing. The fishing I do rarely involves catching anything, as when I do, I am guaranteed to freak out, make someone else deal with it, throw it back and shudder for the next half an hour about the terrible thing that just happened. Because actually, converse to everything I said before, fishing for me was a way to be in nature and not have an action. I mean, I did, I was fishing, but it's more akin to meditation. You sit very still and concentrate on your thing but the movement of water. Time is irrelevant. You are just being. The problem is I can't just be without doing, but that's completely counterintuitive. So I tricked myself by having the absolute minimum of doings to do. I was quiet and focused, a state I rarely experienced except weirdly at the aquarium. <clears throat> I absolutely loved it. I'm sure there are other outdoor activities that would provide the same absorbing tranquility. Twitching maybe? Cloud watching? The point is, give a meditative pursuit a bash. <coughs> Find some reason to be peacefully immobile. Give yourself a whisper of something to hook in, in your mind so it doesn't take the chance to race. I never thought I'd say it, but it can be incredibly helpful to just be static. Go on tour. Back to the old proactive jump on the horse and ride it fast to OK Town method. When you are in a period of loss, everything around you can remind you that life is a bit terrible. Your stupid kitchen is the same stupid kitchen. The walk to the shop is woefully predictable. Where is the wonder in the world? Well, I can tell you where it isn't. In your house, probably. Sometimes it's okay to say, I'm booking my tired body and my even tireder mind a trip. I'm talking about an actual physical excursion. Could be a weekend in a tent in Len Dudno. Could be a month in Mexico. Could be a year traveling the globe. Sometimes you need a change of scenery so marked that not even your last subconscious can pipe up and say, that mountain looks a bit like my ex-boyfriend. It doesn't cause me unless maybe you're looking at Mount Rushmore and your ex was heavily into historical reenactments. <clears throat> Sometimes it's good to remind yourself that while the world can be an awfully cruel cool place, it's also incredible. That there are still many, many things to marvel at. That the sun on your face can warm your heart for a minute. That you can just bathe in otherness for a bit. <coughs> a few years ago, I left a job that involved working for a chaotic tyrant who gaslighted the buggery out of any of her staff to be her a closest ally or the substitute child. I massively spun out. I was anxious to the point of thinking I might have to be hospitalized. I had become comfortable in that toxic environment and to leave felt absolutely terrifying as I just bought a flat and in it found a little normality after five straight years of living with a parent or in-law. And I was about to risk all that to move to another role that maybe wouldn't work out. <clears throat> it all seemed absolutely the highest stakes and I was convinced I'd ruin everything. Unfortunately, the next job was even worse, but that is not the point. The point is, I had a holiday booked that my lovely pals had got me for my 30th birthday. As much as I thought I would go catatonic in Sardinia, and uh, have to be ferried around in a sedan chair, that break from London was transformative. <coughs> yes, I was still having all-consuming black thoughts, crying for no reason twice a day, doing a lot of mindfulness and laying down clothes I was uh, overwhelmed pretty much all the time. But I also had moments of wonder and escapism and mental rest that I wouldn't have got in my usual surroundings. 
<clears throat> in a very basic sense, absolutely everything was different and sometimes that was glorious. For the world around you to feel loud and bombastic and like it doesn't give a shit about your pain, but in a way that won't make you furious. You can't be furious at Arancini. You can take this at a micro level and go to an exhibition, a theme park, to see an action film, or visit some botanical gardens. But I do think there's something about getting in the car, train, bus, plane, and knowing you won't be home for a little bit that's really excellent for the soul. Let them eat cake. I know I can get notes about not pushing yourself and going at your own pace and using your intuition and things that also there are ways to push yourself. Push yourself to do something that you know has brought you joy in the past. It can be as simple as eating a really shiny item of patisserie or watching the snooker or putting on some lipstick or getting a haircut or going to a spa. Yes, I know I said that was stupid, but it might might not be stupid at some point in the journey or go for dinner or anything try nourishing yourself it might sound mad but maybe diarize an alert for say once a fortnight to try a thing you loved again start small you don't need to career straight back into base jumping but test yourself if it feels too much you could task a friend or relative with coming up with a cherry challenge once a month <clears throat> this is very much another tried and tested thing for me when we moved into the farm dad was basically smashed to smithereens my nan and her sister my auntie sue and uh, sometimes their mom my nanny ai would host the friday night club real club real name real awesome they had correctly assumed that the environment we were living in the chaos and the mania and the fights and the crying was all completely intolerable for young children. So once a week, they would take us out and do something totally escapist with us. Bowling or a crazy golf or an unforgettable night of making peg dolls at Nanny AI's bungalow that feels like a scene from a film. I remember it so clearly. I am so grateful that they cared enough to know we were hurting and that they decide to do something about it that it makes me weep to this day. We we're very lucky to have such amazing women around us that their emotional intuition was so in tune they saved us and the point i'm getting at is they took the reins and let us have a little go at things we usually liked once a week didn't matter if we hated it no pressure just someone flashing some things you liked under your nose and seeing what you make of it you'll be surprised what connects so be active in familiarizing yourself with joy. See if you can let it in again. No pressure if you can't, it will show its face one day. Get a dog, as it sounds. So there you have my self-care chapter. It's not exhaustive. It's scant and clearly actionable suggestions. It's an extrovert's nightmare. But I think what it's trying to say is do a little of what makes you happy whether you want to or not. You deserve moments of rest and comfort so seek them out wherever you can.